We're going to dig in uh, this week uh, to chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians. This series, we're walking through uh, 1 Corinthians, and we're, we've taught, titled this series, Becoming Us, and it was about Paul's letters to the Corinthian church. This was a church that was in a city that, was, that dealt with a lot of uh, sexual immorality and diversity and corruption, uh, religious diversity, and, and it was just really hard for these people to become a church, to become something that was making an impact on their world, Uh, but Paul wrote to them so that they would understand and they would kind of know how God wants us to operate as a church, and so that's what we're doing in this series, and one of the first issues that he addressed was divisions in the church. He wanted, uh, don't define yourself by the people that you follow, define yourself by following Jesus, and last week we looked at spiritual authority and influence and leadership uh, because Paul says this, he says that we have to submit as servants to the will of God and act as stewards of God's truth. So if you want to be in spiritual leadership, that's what you got to do. We, and for us who aren't in spiritual leadership or maybe we're, we're following somebody, which all of us really are it, to, to one degree or another, we have to be humble and teachable because God brings people into our lives at certain moments to help us grow. There are two types of messages that you'll hear in a church, two types of series that we do here. The first is called a topical series. That's when we like just take a topic and we just kind of see what the Bible says about that. So back in November, how many of you guys remember the Thanks Living series that we did? So Thanks Living series. So we were like, what does the Bible have to say to us about Thanksgiving? And so we did that. And then we did another um, back the month before, we did one on the art of neighboring. What does the Bible say about us being a better neighbor? And so these are really helpful for us to get a broad view of what the Bible says about a specific topic. The other kind, that's topical. The other kind is what's called exegetical. That's a really big Bible, college, theology, seminary, seminary, seminary-ish word, right? There we go. Uh, And what that means is that we're going to look at the text. We're going to look at the text and what the text says, that's what we're going to learn about, right? And so these series, we've actually done a couple of these series too. Near to the Throne uh, was a series that we did on the Lord's Prayer where we walked line by line through the Lord's Prayer. We did a series uh, last year on the book of Colossians where we went through the book of Colossians and saw what it says. And currently this series, Becoming Us, it's about the two letters to the Corinthian church. Exegetical series help us take a deeper dive into a book and it makes us look at topics and things we don't think about necessarily but that we need to talk about because the bible talks about it and this week we arrive in chapter 5 of 1 corinthians which deals with the topic of sexual sin i have uh i want to preface this uh message today with an admission and a story First, the admission. Uh, pastors get really excited about preaching about vision and purpose and freedom and salvation and deliverance and all those things. Woo, right? But like a topic like today, it's like, uh, do I have to? Okay, let's do it, right? Um, the other thing is uh, the story is <laughs> when I was about 13 years old, the church that we attended at the time, um, they had a set of beliefs, that church had a set of beliefs that the Bible, part of the Bible was no longer effective to us today, right? They just didn't believe that. And that's not what I believe. I believe that the Bible says that it's true. We just got to lean into that. We got to know that the Bible is speaking to us. And the, the, the preacher that was preaching this series um, would, would preach and he actually would like skip through the parts that, of the Bible that were like questionable to his like theology or his worldview. Like he would just skip it. And I remember my mom would sit there and she had this big teal Bible, right? And like back then, you know, they call the Bible the, the sword of the spirit. Like back then, like you bought like broad swords, like they were huge, right? And mom would have this Bible and it had this cover with a zipper on it, right? And I remember sitting there in the service and as the pastor would just randomly skip passages of scripture, I remember my mom just zipping up her Bible and you could hear it in the church. It was like, zip, 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 you know, like in the church. And it was like, well, I guess we're not going to talk about that today, right? And I resolved then that, because I knew then that God had called me to pastor, that we're not going to skip through parts of this, 
the parts that are tough for us to talk about, the parts that are difficult, the parts that may not go along with what our culture thinks and our culture believes, the parts of uh, that, that maybe opinions that we have and the opinions that are prevalent in our society are questionable to us, we've got to take a dive. We've got to look into this because it's not about what we believe and what we think and what our opinion, it's about what this says to us, Right? And so we have to go through these things. We have to talk about these things, even when they're kind of awkward, even when they're kind of weird, even when they're tough to talk about. And we need to resolve to say that the Bible is the authority that we're going to live by. God's word is the authority that we're going to grow in and that we're going to live by. Second Timothy 3, verse 13, uh, uh, verse uh, 16 and 17 says this, all scripture, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable Profitable, that means it's beneficial to us for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness that the man of God or the woman of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Back in our Near to the Throne series where we were looking at the Lord's Prayer, I taught about the difference between two ways of interpreting Scripture. The first was exegesis, this is where we get the word exegetical from. What that means is I'm going to see what the Bible says. And I'm going to let that shape who I am, right? That means to draw out of. It's like drawing out of the well. It's like attempting to objectively discover what the meaning of the text is and then draw it out and allow it to shape my worldview. The opposite of this is the word eisegesis, and that means to lead into. That means I'm going to take my biases, my opinion, what my political views, my worldview, and I'm going to project that on the text. And I'm going to pick out verses that agree with me and say, oh yeah, well, that's, that's this, and that's that, and that's that. There's 66 books in here, written over about 1,500 years. Long time that this Bible was written. I guarantee you, if you have an opinion you can find some sentence in there that's going to agree with your opinion, right? But we don't want to do that. We want to look at the whole Bible. We want to see what the whole thing says to us, and then we want that to shape who we are. We don't want to make it agree with what I already think and feel, my desires, my thoughts, my wants, my traditions. We don't want to do that. We want to approach it and have the Bible shape us. And I say all that to get to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, if you got your Bibles, this is what he was addressing in the church. He says, it's actually reported, so I've gotten news, that there is sexual immorality among you and of the kind not even tolerant among the pagans. For a man has his father's wife, this was his stepmom, and you are arrogant. Ought you not to mourn Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though I am absent in body, and what he means by that is I'm not there physically with you, I am present in spirit. And as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did this thing. When you were assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present, and with the power of the Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved for the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Do you remember that a little leaven, a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump and, and as really are unleavened. This is all about making bread. Anybody, any bread makers in the house? Right? Yeah. Not anymore, but you were at one time, so we know what we're talking about, right? So it's, 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 it's as it's growing. One time Liz and I, <laughs> I'll stop here for a second. One time, listen, we were cooking Thanksgiving dinner and we bought the kind of bread that you have to proof, right? You have to stick it out and you have to let it sit there and you have to let it grow and rise before you bake it. But then we forgot to take it out. And so we, uh, we took it out uh, while we were getting ready to serve because we do like the five minute rolls. That's what we do. We took it out and then we we're like, oh, well, we can't cook this right now because we're supposed to let it rise. And we set it on our counter and then we forgot it was there, right? Because we couldn't cook it anyway. Three days later, I promise you, this thing was like this big. Like it was just, it had grown and grown and grown to something that was completely unedible. We had had to throw the pan away. Like it was horrible, right? But this thing just kept growing and growing and growing. The yeast in it just kept growing and growing and growing. And that's what Paul is talking about here. When you have just a little bit of sin that's in there, it's going to grow. 
For Christ, our Passover lamb, let's keep reading. For Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us, uh, let us celebrate the festival, not the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, all the old things, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity, the, the things that God has already pulled out of us. Let's celebrate with that heart. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexual immoral people. So there was a previous letter before 1 Corinthians that Paul sent. That's okay. Paul's writing to them. We got 1 Corinthians today. In my previous letter, not to associate with sexual immoral people. Not at all meaning the sexual immoral of the world or the greedy or the swindlers or the idolaters. Since then, you would need to go out of the world. But now I am writing you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of a brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what I have to do judging, for what do I have to do judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge that evil person f- from among you. There are two ideas here that we've got to talk about. The first is that the, the sin itself, like what happened there, what Paul was addressing. We've got to address that. The second is this idea of purging this person from the church. That seems weird to a lot of us. That seems like odd. Like why would he say that there? In Romans chapter 1, Paul talks about sexual sin as dishonorable passions. Some Christians like to uh, particularly go after one type of sexual sin over another. For, for example, maybe um, uh, we don't like homosexuality, uh, but pornography is a different, you know, there's like levels of it, right? But that's not what Paul does. Paul doesn't, Paul doesn't like put uh, levels on it. What he does is he just kind of groups everything together as dishonorable passions in Romans 1. These refer to sexual sin, dishonorable passions. This guy, uh, Bloom, says it this way. Dishonorable passions are sexual sin in all of its deviant expressions. It's a manifestation of humanity unhinged from its creator. We've taken uh, the, what, we've, what we believe and how God created things to be, and we take it away from the way that God created it, so we unhinge ourselves from the Creator. The real root of perversion, of which dishonorable passions and, and these perversions, is just one fruit, and that is human pride. Human pride. Pride is a black hole of consuming selfishness where at the core of fallen hum- is fallen human nature. Pride's nature is to consume, to bring into oneself, and it, to see it sees other people, all of creation, even God himself, as a thing to use in service of one's selfish desires. So when we see this happening in the lives of people, in the lives of of Christians, in the lives of even non-Christians, at the core, there's a spirit of pride. You can't tell me what to do. You can't tell me how to live. You can't tell me who, who, what, what I, I can do or shouldn't do with, with, with my body or with that. I shouldn't, like, I should be able to make all of those decisions and I should be able to consume what I want to consume. The spirit that lies underneath this is pride. Some Christians or people who think that they're more progressive in their worldview may argue that the church has an irrational fixation with an antiquated view of sexuality. But in a healthy church, this is a misunderstanding and mischaracterization. A healthy church is simply made up, listen to this, a healthy church is simply made up of healthy individuals unified in the pursuit and worship of God. A healthy church is simply made up of healthy individuals unified in the pursuit and worship of God. If there is something that is causing some individuals to be unhealthy, then the healthy church's natural desire is to want to fix that, is to want to make that better, is to want to help that be healthy. Just like an immune system would work to remove a virus, a healthy church, a healthy body would have a natural desire to remain and stay healthy. If the underlying desire of this group of people is to pursue and worship God, then we don't get to rewrite the rules as we go along. 
We don't get to shape the Bible to what it says to us. We don't get to, to, to uh, write our own rules. We must love what God loves and hate what God hates. We've got to get to that point. And if there's something in your life where you know that God hates it, because it's destructive, because there's a spirit of pride that's underneath it, or whatever it is, if there's something in your life, for us to be healthy, we have to hate what God hates. And you're like, well, hate's a strong word. I was taught that God loves everything, and God just doesn't, and God doesn't hate anything. No, God hates things. God hates things that destroy people. God hates things that, that, that cause people to sin. God hates things that separate people from himself. And for us to be a healthy church, we have to love what God loves, Love health, love happiness, love relationships, love people. We have to love those things, but we have to hate what God hates. We'll get to this idea more in a moment, but Romans 10 talks about how we're saved through confession. 1 John 1 talks about how we're forgiven and purified through confession. And James 5 talks about how we're healed through confession. What is confession? Confession is simply agreement. It's when I say the same thing about an issue as what God says. I say the same thing about an issue as what God says. And so when I confess it with my mouth that Jesus is Lord in Romans 10, I'm, I'm saying the same thing that God has said. When I confess my sins and I'm forgiven and purified in John 1, when I do that, I'm forgiven and purified because I've called my sin the same thing that God calls it. When James 5, when it talks about confessing our sins one to another so that we may be healed, I'm in my group, in my people. We're not having, you know, we're coming together as a church. And I've, I've actually heard stories of, of people who were actually on staff at churches. And they would, like, they're doing God's work. But on the side, they're, they're doing all these things that, that, that aren't in the Bible. They're gambling. They're back slandering and all these things just, just among themselves. And, and what that's doing is that's saying that I'm not, I'm not coming to align what I live, what I think, what I believe. I'm not coming into to align with what God says. And so I can't be healed from it. I can't be healed. So we have to confess. We have to come into agreement with what God is saying. The second idea that Paul talks about is this idea of purging someone from the church. And I want to really start with this or or talk through this. And, and, And Paul mentions this in a previous letter that he sent. He said, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with these people but then he says, I wasn't meaning the people of the world, because if, the, if that happened, then you wouldn't, wouldn't go out in the world. It seems that this is the second time that Paul challenged this church to distance themselves from immoral people. To distance themselves from the mother, immoral people. The first time, they misunderstood what he was saying. They misunderstood what he was saying. They thought, well, because the, there, there's definitely people like this in the world, and we can think, I mean, if you have a job or you have a neighbor, or you have, there's, there's definitely people like this in the world, and I'm just going to distance myself. I'm going to go into my bunker, and I'm never going to come out, right? How many of you guys know people that think like that, right? There's people that think like that. And Paul's like, guys, if, if you do think like that, you're never going to go. You won't go shop. You won't go buy groceries because you're going to come in contact, contact with people like that all the time. That wasn't what he was saying. What he was saying was, he clarifies this and says, I'm not talking about the people who are outside of the church. I'm talking about, because God judges those people. That's what he says in verse 13. I'm talking about the people who are inside of the church. The ideology and people we need to distance ourselves from, think of ideology first. The ideology that we need to distance ourselves from is from people who would profess the name of Jesus, but then use his grace to justify continued sin. Use grace to justify continued sin. Romans 6 verse 1 and 2 says this, what should we say then? Should we continue in sin so that grace may abound? By no means, how can we who died to sin still live in it. We have been given, you and I have been given a full portion of grace. You've been given a full portion. God's not holding back on you. Does this mean that if you mess up now that you're a Christian and now that you believe in him and now that you serve him that God won't forgive you? No, he will continue to forgive you. You can still get more grace. But the idea of I should really try to set my sin bar a lot higher so that grace can like be higher than that, that's destructive. 
That's destructive. And so we have to say the same things about sin that God says. We have to love what God loves and hate what God hates. We've been given a full portion of grace. We shouldn't take it on as a challenge to see how much more grace we can get for the sin that we continue in. We've got to stop. In 1 John 1, verse 1, or 6 and 7, I mentioned this before, but I want to read it. If we say we have fellowship with him while walking in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, God, cleanses us from all sin. Why would you purge someone from the church? That seems a contradiction to some of our views of love and acceptance found elsewhere in the Bible. Why would we do that? Why is he talking about that here? The idea is actually really simple. It's redemptive and it's actually hopeful. It's just like when uh, if, if there was an addict that you knew that was chasing the next high who was in bondage, uh, they would say and do anything destructive to, to, that would hurt themselves and other people. They would manipulate the system. They would take words and twist them and do things like that. And this is what happens when we as humans are in bondage of any kind, of any kind. This is what happens. And so we, what, what, what happens when you work with this addict is when you, when, you, when you deal with them, you have to get them to the moment. They, they get to the moment where they're fully consumed by the addiction, by the issue, by the bondage. But sometimes they can actually continue to maintain a normal life with relational crutches, Right? They can still maintain a normal life if there's relational crutches around them. So if there's people that, that are like, oh, yeah, I guess it's okay that you continue to act like that. I'll keep giving you money. I know that I know you're going to go spend it on drugs, but I'll just keep giving it to you, right? I'll keep, I'll keep allowing you to do that. I'll keep, I'll keep allowing you, you know, if it's a, a teenager, I'll keep allowing you to take your computer into your room alone, when I know that, there's, that you're not doing stuff that you should be doing it, you don't do that. You don't do that to people. You have to like put a stop to it. You have to say that's, that's where it's going to stop. We don't continue to do it because we know that if we continue to keep things normal as they are, we're actually hurting that person. We're actually hurting that person. They need to hit a rock bottom. They need to hit a realization in their own heart and under their own spirit. And that is where the hope of redemption and kicking that addiction kicks in. Cutting off normalcy actually is intended to expedite this. It's intended to expedite recovery. No one actually loves them or no one who actually loves them is excited to remove relational crutches. I've met with parents who, who, who have children who are dealing with this, and they aren't excited to say, you know what, I'm, I'm excited. This is a really good week. I'm going to have to tell my kid that they can't live at home anymore because they're spending all their money on things that they shouldn't be spending their money on that's destroying them. They're not excited about that. They're not, they're not sitting in judgment. They're not li- living in pride over that. No, they're actually, they're actually, it breaks your heart to do that. Their love for the person wants to see them set free. And to do that, they're willing to go through pain and s- the sobering step because in the end, they want to see the person released from bondage. So when Paul is talking about this idea of releasing a brother and sister, of just saying, hey, enough's enough, you can't continue to do that, he's saying that the sin, this sexual sin, this issue that we have, it is not normal. Therefore, it cannot be accepted and continue to be normalized. We can't say it's, it's normal for us to do. It, you just can't continue to live like that. We can't keep going down this road. And again, this is not directed at people outside the faith. This is directed at insiders. And the hope is, and, and Romans 1 talks about this, is that God turns people over to their depraved mind, their debased mind. And the hope is, is that when they hit rock bottom, that that's when we come in as the church. That's when we're there. That's when we're there to wrap our arms around them and say, you're loved and you're appreciated and God, God loves you and we're there for you and we want to restore you back to where you were. If someone is refusing confession, if we don't want to say the same things about sin that God says, openly disagreeing with God, that person is naturally not going to fit into a community whose unifying goals 
is the worship and pursuit of God. It's not going to be a natural fit. So the hope is always for redemption. We want to see God put people back together in their brokenness, in their whatever depravity is destroying them. We want to see God meet them where they are and put them back together. And we realize that it's the Holy Spirit that does that work. Parents, you may need to write this down. There are two types of discipline. There are two types of discipline. And again, Paul, what he's dealing with here, he's talking about sexual sin, but he's also talking about church discipline. There's two types of discipline. The first one is punitive. Punitive, that, that comes from the word, it means punishment, right? And so what punitive is, is I want to punish them. I want them to pay for what they did. I want them to suffer for the hurt that they caused. I'm okay if we never have to talk again. They need to pay. That's the first type of punishment. The second type of punishment is restorative. Restorative is different. You know, you may, you still are disciplined. You're still bringing punishment. You're still like, there's still consequences to the action. But the heart behind it is this. I want to see them return to where they are or where they were before they sinned. I want to give them the opportunity to be restored and to grow from this mistake and this error. Once the issue is resolved, I would love to have a relationship with them again. That is how God treats sin in our lives. God wants a relationship with us. The Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Jesus came and died for us. He paid the price for our sin so that we could be healed. And so we don't have to stay in darkness. We don't have to stay in sin. We don't have to stay in bondage. The idea for, for someone who, to say, I've come into light. I've come into hope. I've, I've been set free. I've received grace, but I'm still okay with staying in bondage in this area of my life. It doesn't make sense. Jesus died so that you and I could be free of everything. If there is a part of your life that is staying in the dark, Jesus didn't die for it to stay that way. He wants to bring you fully into the light, fully set free, fully forgiven, fully out of bondage, fully free to worship him and serve him and fully free to become everything that he created you to be. Don't stay in the darkness. I invite Aaron back up. We're going to sing here in a little bit, but I want to read a couple more things for you. First John 1, John says this, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, if we say what God says about it, if we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. So many times when we're dealing with this topic, we don't want to bring it into the light because there's shame attached to it. There's guilt attached to it. There's this idea of like, why, why am I still dealing with this? Why am I still dealing with this? But John says, don't deceive yourself. Confess your sin, and when you do, God is faithful and just to cleanse, to forgive, to set free. God doesn't want you to stay in bondage. He wants you to be healed. He wants you to be restored. He wants all of you in the light and none of you in the darkness. Don't settle for darkness when light is freely given.